morning. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, God is good. Jesus is alive. I hope everybody had a good Christmas. I really have nothing prepared for today. Honestly, I was hoping Suzanne was going to be here so I didn't have to talk. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm just going to go right and open the floor for anyone that wants to share anything, prayer request testimony. Peter? Quiet crowd today, tough crowd. Yeah. She's standing with you. Yes.
Yeah. stand. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you do for us, Lord, and we thank you for everything that you give to us. Father, we thank you for all the blessing, for all the grace that you pour on us, for the people that you put in our lives, Lord, that, that you shine through them, Lord, that bless us just by meeting them, that share your favor with us, Lord. We thank you, Father, because we also can give back what you have given to us, Lord, to others that don't have the blessing, so they can know of you. They can come to see and understand and meet who you are, Lord. And they can come to believe you so that your blessing, Lord, starts to manifest in their lives. We thank you for our family, for our friends, and for giving us your only son, Jesus, Lord, to come to this earth so that we might believe in him that we come close to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for all the blessings, Lord. Protect those that are not here. Heal those that are sick. Provide for those that are in need. We know that you have completed all of the promises that you have made us, Lord. Relationships have been restored. Healing has taken place. Praise the Father, you are calling forth your children. And they are coming to your presence, Lord. Friday, January 9th, Eastern Gate House Prayer. You can come. It's a good time. It's a good time. Yeah. Um, I want to add on to that. Um, the prayer team, um, Eastern Gate House of Prayer, has been invited to another 24 hour burn, they call it, up at uh, Carson. Uh, they're going to be doing 24 hour nonstop worship and praise, and they've asked us to come up and do a, a two hour set. of intercession, uh, standing in the gap for our brothers and sisters in this region. Um, <clears throat> apparently, we left an impact that they weren't expecting, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> he's on the throne, and we rattled a few bones, um, and we pray that those bones come to life. Yeah. Um, it's, this is what it takes to get the grace message out. We're going. I mean, yeah. that's all it's to it. That's yeah, all it's to it. So yeah. pray for us. Uh, we'll try to have it this evening. 
just pray for us because uh, <clears throat> no matter what goes on, this is home base for us. Um, but we need you also to pray that you can come on Friday night, at least for Friday, this coming Friday night, to spend some time with us praying, um, sending in the gaps, um, bringing forth things that I know the kingdom uh, needs to be furthered in this region, in this area, in this church. I know <coughs> the labor <laughs> All right, let's pick the word. <laughs> Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of the servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, John and Toby, would you mind taking the offering, please? Let's worship. Hallelujah. 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 As they're finishing up offering and worship. 
team getting ready. <clears throat> I made a comment about uh, youth, uh, junior high and high school, <coughs> pastor. pastor coming forth. <clears throat> All the young ones in this room right now deserve to have a firm foundation and a place prepared for when they enter into their junior high, high school situation. By the time that they are old enough to be in junior high, there will be a foundation already laid and prepared to minister and help them grow in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Hallelujah. Two, three, four. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare in room. And then let nature sing. And then let nature sing. Let it 
Let's cry out. Let's cry out, church. And then I cry, holy, holy is the Lord, who was and is and is to come. And then I cry, holy, holy, holy is the Your will be 
I feel like the Lord was saying to me, I heard the prayer requests, and I understand, uh, but this is the answer. The songs that we sing are, are simply agreeing with God. We need to declare. If it's about a job, let's start speaking that new job, that new situation, that new circumstance. If it's healing, let's start speaking healing. Right? If it's a financial breakthrough you need, let's start speaking that everything you set your hand to prospers. Because he said that we're, we're saying the very things that we're wanting. He is the power. He is the glory. Forever. Amen. That means so be it. I mean, Mary, when, when the angel came and told her, look, uh, God's going to overshadow you. You're going to have this child. She didn't understand it. She didn't know how all that was going to work. She didn't get the theology of it. She only knew physical stuff. She only knew the natural. But she said, be it unto me, even as you have spoken. That's what we need to be saying. Be it unto our loved ones, even as you have said, Lord, according to your word. His word is the final word. We just have to declare it and continue to declare it. You can't declare it a couple of times and then declare the other side of it. You just dug up the seed. Now you got to sow it again. We need to be consistently declaring what it is the Word of God says about our circumstance and our situation and not back off. Do not back off. Do not go by your sight. Don't go by what you're seeing or what you're hearing. That's the realm of the enemy. That's where the devil realms. His realm is in the flesh. The sight, the hearing, the, the touch, the smell, the, the taste, the sense realm. That's where he operates. That's where he rules. Now, we're in that realm, but we're not of that realm. We have to operate from another realm. We have to operate from the kingdom of God. And the way that we do that is by declaration. We do it by speaking. You know, everything God did, he did by saying. He didn't, he didn't work up a sweat to create this. He just said. And Jesus said, he was I am. And he said, I'm giving you now, I'm giving you that same power. Go ye therefore. Lay hands on the sick. Declare the kingdom. That's the authority that we have. The authority we have is to say whatever it is in the name of God. As long as it's in agreement with this. It doesn't have to be verbatim. It doesn't have to be word for word. It just has to agree with it. That's the power that's been given to us as the children of God. Words have power. We all know it. Or there wouldn't be 50 million commercials in every football game. I only know football because that's all I've been watching. Praise the Lord. Amen? But the words that are spoken in truth are the greatest power. Lots of things are said. And they may be facts, but there's only one truth. And that's what the Word of God says. And that's what we need to stand on. That's what we need to declare. I know it's difficult. If it were easy, everybody would do it. But that's why it's called faith. We believe without evidence. We look at, in the face of defeat and we declare victory. We look in the face of lack and we declare abundance. Exactly. We look at sickness and we declare healing. Yes. That's what our responsibility is. That's the only thing we have to do. Amen. We believe, therefore we speak. And what we speak is generally what we believe. And the enemy pumps us full of facts that are not in agreement with this. Amen. And sadly, too many times we say it without thinking. Yeah. It isn't that we're against God, it's just that we're overwhelmed with all this other information and we say things that are counterproductive. They're anti what God wants to do in our lives. And we wonder why we end up reaping garbage. Because we're declaring it a lot of times. You know, we said about these years ago, but, you know, oh, my back is killing me. Yeah, yeah. Eh, it'd probably be a good thing to just, you know, shut up. Yes. Hey, amen. Or say my back is healed, even yeah. if it doesn't feel healed. That's what, that's what Debbie was saying here the last couple of services, too. Yeah. That's what we do. It's not, it's, not, it's not being in denial. It's just agreeing with the greater amen. truth. Right. Yes. That's what we got to do. Go ahead, Debbie.
Yeah. And we're blind to that. Praise the Lord. That's, a, that's what we're talking about. Put it in his hands and he will take care of it. Amen. That's right. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The more, the more you do it, the more natural it becomes, even though it's supernatural, and the quicker the results. The reason we have prolonged, protracted spaces between our declaration and our manifestation is because there's lots of other things we're declaring in the midst of all of that. Instead of staying steadfast on that word, we're hiccuping, you know, every once in a while because you do have the pain, you know, you do have the statement that comes in the mail. You do have the other testimonies that are negative. And it's so easy to just, without thinking, say it. Not, not meaning it, but just, you just blurt it out, you just say it, and, you know. Go ahead, Debbie. I was just thinking, so you didn't say anything about yourself being the manifestation. I go to the greatest thing that can be is to be a servant. And I don't have the accolades. But God just talks to me like, ah, you just raised the cup this far to the Father. And God says, you can be a servant. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, amen. Just like, just like with Dan and, and, and Tammy. You say, well, somebody rear-ended them. Yeah, but here they are. A lot of people get rear-ended, and they're in traction today, and the car is in a junkyard somewhere totaled. You know, I mean, things happen because we live in a world that is under a curse. I mean, the natural realm is still fallen. But the only way we have authority over it is to recognize we're not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. Our, our power, our authority, our assistance all comes from another realm. It's, we've talked about it many, many times. Please be seated. It's like uh, we're ambassadors, the scripture says. Well, ambassadors don't live from the country that they're in. They survive and are blessed and abundant because their host country, the country that they're actually from, supports them. So you could go to a third world country as an ambassador for the United States and live like a king when everybody else is living in abject poverty. Why? Because your resources aren't coming from that place. You're there representing another place, another reality, a reality that is as unreal to them as sometimes a healing might be to us or victory in other situations. To them, they can't even comprehend uh, what we think of as a poverty in this country is a king in some of those places. So we have to recognize that the words that we speak, just like Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they're life. The words that we speak are power. They're not just words. They're not just something that we mutter, you know, that we just let it stumble out of our mouth. I'll, uh, let me, let me give you, a, a, I, I, I might seem excited this morning. I'll probably seeming excited here, but uh, it's because I've only shared this with Sally. But I got a thing in the mail the other day from a uh, big publishing house. And I'm all excited now because uh, I may have already won some very valuable prizes. <laughs> and the, the thing is, I don't even remember uh, filling out a sweepstake ticket. So we're really worked up about this because, and listen, I'm not going to forget you. When I get it, you know, when I get it, you're, I'm going to share it. I mean, I'm going to spread it around. But so so I'm, if I seem a little excited because I can't wait. I just know it's, it's going to be a great thing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I told Sally this the other day and she was all worked up too until I told her. I may have already won some very valuable prizes. You don't know who you're talking to. This guy is, I could be like really rich. And you didn't even know it. I didn't even know it. <laughs> Praise the 
praise the Lord. So, <laughs> I'm just saying, everything that's said isn't necessarily the truth. We do have to consider the source. This is the truth. I, I have received some very valuable prizes, but they didn't come from Publishers Clearinghouse, and I'm not going to hold my breath waiting on that uh, manifestation because everything that I need and more is right here. This is, this is what we declare. This is who we are. Amen? Now, let's just, let, let's just uh, move along here for a moment. Uh, we'll look at a couple of scriptures here in uh, John chapter 10, verse uh, 28 through 30. Not only do we have to declare the truth with our words, but we are the truth. We carry the truth. So it's important that we project that truth, whether it's in words or just, I'm not talking about living perfect lives. I'm talking about revealing God in honesty. Not some religious image or distortion, but the truth. And here he says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave me, them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now, you remember last week, Jesus' prayer was that we would be one even as he and the Father are one. Now, if you understand that Jesus is God in the flesh, you can't separate that. You know what I mean? There is a spirit, there is the man, but they're one. And that's what he says. He wants the same thing for us, that we would all be one in him. Okay, look at uh, John 17 and verse 3. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So, this true God is perfectly represented in Jesus, and the Spirit of Christ is what dwells in us. So we ought to be the same thing. We ought to be able to be an exact representation of God. We ought to be a revelation, then, of the truth of God. Amen? All right, look at John uh, 1, verses 45 through 47. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Praise the Lord. So, uh, guile back to this uh, publisher's clearinghouse and, you know, any other number of scams that are always coming in the mail and promises and whether it's coming from some kind of who knows where, somebody's basement maybe in Poughkeepsie or, or it could be, you know, really a building somehow or just whatever, you know. Guile is a subtle thing. It's it's deceptive. It's, a, it's a, a, a nuanced lie. And, uh, and what it does is it compels a person to manipulate and distort relationships for personal gain. Whether it's coming from publisher's clearinghouse or from an individual. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. When, when Jesus was picking his disciples, he was impressed by this guy. And the, the ancient Jewish culture wasn't much different than the one we live in today in terms of the way people act. De there was deceit. There was fraud. There was hypocr hypocrisy. That was the norm. 
And sadly, that's the norm for the world we live in. It's amazing, you know, Sheila's talking about car salesmen. It's, it's sad that you got to, you know, that that's, a, you know, you find one that's honest or decent or, or intimidated. I'm not sure what. But, <laughs> but, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Because we think of car salesmen, it's like a lawyer. You just look out because they're going to get you one way or another, yeah. somehow. But Jesus was impressed when he saw a man without wrong ambitions. He didn't say Nathaniel was without sin. And yet Jesus chose him to be one of them that would someday represent him. And I think the, the reason it was important to Jesus was that he wanted people to know that God is relational and not transactional, if that makes sense. He's more interested in the relation than he is the transaction itself. Church has made it transaction. You do this, you do this, God does this. That's not the way it works, not in, not in reality. Jesus wanted God to be trusted, so he needed men and women who represented that truth, that God can be trusted, that you can depend on him, that what he says he'll do. And much of the problems that we have in faith is because we have conflicting views of God because of things we've been told or taught or perceptions that we've had that maybe he'll do it or he might do it for somebody who's really good, but I haven't been really good, so I can't expect it. And that undermines everything God wants because what God's really interested in is that we trust him. That's the only thing he really cares about. Look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Well, now that'll make you rally around the church, won't it? I mean, that's speaking to the religious people. And we're talk, Mike was talking about come, people coming from the north, the south, the east, and the west filling this building up. I'm all for that. We need to be declaring that. That's just all there is to it. That's, our, that's, that's the part we play. God gives the increase. We sow seed. Words are seed, if they're in agreement with this. Right? And we just keep on sowing. And trust God to give the increase. It's true in every area of our lives. It, 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 it's true in every situation and every circumstance. See, the psychology of agenda is that they make relationships transactional. Yes. Right. In other words, if I have an agenda, if I'm trying, uh, I don't want to be too crass here, but just, you know, when I was young and I was looking at some really cute gal or nice looking woman or whatever, I can tell you I had an agenda. I won't tell you what the agenda was, but I had one. And it was about a transaction I was hoping would take place. Now, I'm planning on doing everything I can to make this thing happen. Right? But it's because of the agenda I have, not because of the person. You understand what I'm saying? That's the way the world operates. They, when you have an agenda, you turn everything into a transaction. You turn every relationship into a transaction. It cheapens everything. And it belittles the person and makes them, uh, if they realize what's going on, it makes them feel cheap. Used. Taken advantage of. And it actually diminishes the person that's trying to create the transaction, whether they know it or not. That's what the church has become. And that's the problem with agendas. It means, in other words, that people are used for a purpose. People become a means to somebody else's end. 
And that affects the person's belief that they are valued, regardless of any works of theirs. In other words, it, it, they feel like I only have value for the transaction. I have no real value other than that. It demeans the person. And religion makes us want to build things. What makes us want to grow things and improve on things. And, and those aren't bad ambitions in and of themselves, but they cause the person to be expendable. And they only value them if they play along with the transaction. And subliminally, or without really maybe being aware of it, unbelievers recognize this. I'm a pawn in somebody else's game to build something, to grow something, to get something, to make something happen. Now, the, the growing and the making something happen, is not, it's not a bad thing. But it's the way that we, as, as Christians, I'm just speaking in general terms, manipulate people for our own end. The way we treat people influences what they believe about God. Because whether you like it or not, you're a representation, either for good or for bad. If it looks like we have an agenda other than loving people the way God does, other than wanting to be forgiving and caring and, you know, then it's bogus. We make God look like a dictator instead of a gracious king. John 3, verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Praise God. Now, there's no question that Jesus had hopes for people. He had goals or expectations. And, and he was faithful to this mission. But he didn't have an agenda. Jesus' life shows us to never let goals take priority over people. Nothing wrong with goals. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you should just be like a crapshoot your whole life. But I'm saying your goals shouldn't ever take a priority over people. And sadly, that's what most people see when they look at the church. They want to make a church. They want to influence this. They want to influence that. And I'm just a pawn. I'm just a number in the pew. I'm just a check in the offering. Amen? Now, it's sad that because we know it's more than that personally because we have a relationship with God. But people who don't have that relationship can only look at it from the outside. They only see transactions. And then, sadly, you turn on Christian television and all you see is an agenda. And I don't care what it is. I'll bless you. I'll send you this prayer shawl. I'll get you this. I'll give you a book or something. But give me money. Send me your money. And God will bless you. Because my agenda is God's agenda. No, God does not have an agenda. He has a love for people. See, God knows that it's really hard for people to believe in something that they've never seen before. It's hard for people to believe in something that's never shown up before. You know, the Jewish people had been waiting for a Messiah for a couple thousand years prior to Jesus' arrival. They had scriptural references, they had prophecies, they had promises, there were implications throughout the Bible, but generation after generation came and went without them realizing that hope. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3.
God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So to keep alive this hope, God sent prophets to keep reminding the people, this is the truth, it's going to happen, it's going to come. But the last one came 300 years before Jesus showed up. 300 years of nothing from God. Now, we've all had some dry spells. You may be in one where you're praying, and you just can't hear from God. It just it seems like God just isn't saying anything. But listen, you don't know dry. 300 years, not a word. Now, there had been some imposters show up from time to time, somebody claiming to be the answer, somebody claiming to be the Messiah, someone promising that they were, only to disappoint, only to create even greater doubt in the minds of the people, until after a while the people, just like today, stopped looking for the real deal and started settling for something else. Praise God. Can you even imagine people waiting thousands of years to see their hope realized? Somebody that was going to bring the world back into relationship with God. I mean, it's beyond. I struggle with six months. for a manifestation of a promise. Look at Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Now this blows my mind, because for a couple thousand years, people have been waiting for this manifestation, for this Messiah, for God to come in the flesh. For 300 years, they haven't had a word about it. The hope, the expectation, the disappointment, the, the, the whole gamut of emotions. And then God, instead of sending everybody out a, uh, a letter saying you may have already received some valuable prizes, hides the sweepstake ticket for 30 years. For three decades, he's there, and nobody knows it, or very few. We need to realize, and this is the important aspect of what I'm talking to you about today, we need to realize the power of letting God prepare our way into people's lives, into situations, and into circumstances. I'm not saying we don't have a part to play but we can come off as phony as a publishing house sweepstake <laughs> if God hasn't prepared the way for us. Because all they know is what they've experienced. They don't know you. They don't know what you've been through. They don't know your relationship with God. They just know what they have seen and heard all around. That's why it's so important that we're honest about God, that we don't make him a religious dictator, but that we 
express him as this God of love and grace and compassion and mercy and, 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 and wanting to be a blessing and wanting to provide and, and to do for people, regardless of if, it, if it rubs some people the wrong way. Mike's talking about the, uh, you know, the, the worship team going, and, and they got a little flack and resistance uh, because some people want to feel like they're playing a bigger part in their salvation than they really are. Because that gives them the, then the right in their mind to belittle you, to look down on you, and, and by doing so, elevate themselves. Truth is, he doesn't share his glory. Not in that way. Not, not by what we do. It's a finished work that he does. Yes. In any way we can express that, there's going to be resistance to it from religious-minded people. Yes. There always has been, there always will be. Yes. But, you know, I, I, there's something interesting. Jesus, you know, when Paul, when the early church had issues with religion versus grace, James, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem and all the churches that came out from under that mother church there, the satellites or whatever you want to call them, he, because of this conflict between Jews and Gentiles who were all claiming to be Christians, he gets together with Paul and Paul tells him this is the message of grace. So he gives an explanation, and he says things like, uh, you know, it's not necessary that we put things on the Gentiles that God hasn't requested of us or demanded of us, and, uh, you know, it's not works, it's not this, and it's not that. But if you, what's interesting is that it, then if you look completely through uh, the, the rest of the uh, epistles that Paul wrote, whether it was Galatians or whatever it was, he never makes reference. Now, he, he was the reason that James said what he said. But Paul never references that, hey, James is on my side because he said this, this, and this. And you know why? Because James came short of the totality of the gospel of grace. It sounded like he'd made a giant leap, you know, for grace. But only if you were religious. Right. Only if you had this idea that I got to do this and I got to do that and I got, yeah. they got to be circumcised. They got to not eat pork. They got to, you know, all this stuff. He never references it anywhere. Every place else he goes, he just preaches the gospel of grace. Why? Because it would have diminished it. It would have made it less than what it was. Amen? Uh, someone much smarter than me has said, and it's, and it's true, I think it goes all the way back to uh, uh, oh my, I, won't, I won't guess at the name now. So, Who said that if you don't, if your preaching of the gospel doesn't cause people to think and ask the question that was asked of Paul, that should we then sin more, that grace would abound, was that you're not preaching enough of it. Unless it causes people to think, well, if wherever sin abounds, grace doth that much more abound, people, then if you preach it the way it should be preached, the first initial instinct of a person is, whoo, whoo, let's party like it's 1999 because we got a pass here. Well, in fact, you do have. Grace, you're covered. Now, there are consequences to partying like it's 1999. You got to get up in 2000, right? So there are, there are natural consequences of our stupid decisions. But it's not judgment from God. It's not you're cut off now from going to heaven or you're going to be cursed under some horrible thing. No, there's just consequences. Yeah. Get drunk and drive and run into something. You probably go into jail and lose your license and probably not get insurance for a while. Is that God? No, it's the law and your insurance company. It's a natural response to a poor decision. All right? But it's not God. It's just consequences. So people need to know that. We've got people running around thinking every snowstorm, every lightning strike, every house fire, everything that ever happened is God coming and getting me. Why? Because I know I deserve it. And I've dodged the bullet so long that it's got to catch up with me at some point. That's a, that's a horrible way to live your life. Always looking over your shoulder thinking God's, 
He's got to get. He's going to get me. It's why people are afraid when a black cat runs in front of them, or they walk under a ladder. All the other superstitious junk that they get, it all gets caught up in a religious kind of way of thinking that something bad's going to happen because I deserve something bad to happen. Because that's this transactional way of thinking rather than relational. That God just loves you and wants to bless you in spite of you. Praise the Lord. Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 26 through 29. See, God is doing something in your life. Think about your life. Just think about your own life. You heard things about God. You, 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 know, you went to Sunday school or church or Bible school or whatever, but you still lived your life kind of, you know, with aware, awareness of that but not really allowing it to have a lot of influence because you didn't really know how to relate to it. Right. Amen? Amen? Well, think of the people that had never been exposed to anything. And believe me, there's all kinds of them right out here that live around us. Exactly. That you don't have to go to, you know, Africa or someplace to find people that haven't heard the gospel. There are churches filled with people that haven't heard the gospel. They've heard a religious teaching, they've heard some theology and some doctrine, but they haven't really heard the gospel. So he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Now, if we relate this metaphorical parable, or whatever you want to call it, to us, here's what's happening. First of all, the man does get to scatter seed. He does get to sow. But secondly, and more importantly, all of the growth is happening while the guy is sleeping. He sows, but he has nothing to do with the growth of this thing. He's oblivious to it. He's sleeping. You could say he's resting. He says what God says, and then he rests because it's finished. What God said is finished. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. I'm saying how I believe God will fill this church, how God will save our families, how God will save our neighbors and the community and the city and this world. Because this gospel has not been preached. There's been stuff preached. But he says, until this gospel is preached, the end won't come. And I think we're living in a time when this gospel will be preached. And it'll be preached by people like you. And not to, you know, be too redundant, but like the old uh, Catholic uh, priest said, uh, preach the gospel. And if you have to, use words. Praise the Lord. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Praise the Lord. All right, John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, Yeah, it's the Sabbath, but my father works all the time. He's always working. And I am an exact representation of him. Therefore, I'm working all the time. We don't work all the time. We sow. We sow. And sleep. And he works all the time. Praise God. There there is a... There is such truth 
and learning to rest in the finished work of the cross. It doesn't make us indolent. It doesn't make us dolts and, and you know, dredges and just slobs and lazy and non-productive. But all we do is sow and then rest in that truth and God will give the increase. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's healing or financial breakthrough or relationship issues or whatever it is. We say what the word says. We sow and then we rest because anything other than that is counterproductive. It's going out and rooting up the seed to see if it's actually still in the ground because we haven't seen its bud yet. It will bud on its own. It'll do it automatically because that's what the seed does. The seed is good. Get it in the ground. Anybody is good soil. Some's better than others. Some respond quicker and whatever. But God gives the increase. God will cause it to, to it may not happen for 20 years. But they were waiting 2,000. And God said, ah, not quite. Another 30 years. Praise the Lord. Remember John 146? Let's look at this again. You say, well, we're in Des Moines. This is a little church. We've got Nathan for a pastor. And Nathaniel said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. See, Nazareth hadn't been the most productive place. It wasn't a spiritual hub. You know, it wasn't where all the prophets wanted to come to and go to and get a meeting there. Everybody joked about the place. And they joked about the people that were in that place. I don't know if you ever watched national TV, but Des Moines, Iowa, is rarely ever even spoken of. And when it is, it's usually done with disdain. It's like those hicks back there in Iowa. Come on, give me a break. You know, we're, after all, we're sophisticated. We're, we live in New York or the East Coast or, or we're hip because we're in California. But those farmers in Iowa. You know, there were four, four guys went to high school together. And uh, they graduated high school, went on to university in different pursuits. And one of them became a priest, a Catholic priest. One of them became a professor of ethics. One of them became a doctor, an MD. And the other one became a farmer. And after years and years, they went decided to go back for their, like, their 30th uh, high school class reunion. And they get back together. They're all they're seeing each other. Say, well, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm t telling each other what their, how their lives have gone and what they've gotten involved with and everything. And somehow the conversation uh, turned to uh, when does life begin? And the the priest said, well, life begins at conception. And then the ethics professor he said, no, he said it begins at birth. And the doctor, the MD, says, well, both of you are wrong. He said, actually, medically speaking, it, it begins in the 12th week. And the farmer, he's just kind of standing there listening and has a big grin on his face, and he said, you all are wrong. You're all wrong. And the priest said, you're a farmer, and you're going to tell me when life begins? And the ethics professor said, I've got eight years of college. I have a doctor's degree in ethics. And you, a farmer, are going to tell me when life begins? The farmer said, yeah. The doctor said, I've been helping women give birth for nearly 20 years. And you're going to tell me when life begins? And the farmer said, yeah. He said, life begins when your oldest child leaves home and takes the dog with him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I 
But the truth is, Jesus said this is when life begins. When you believe in the Father and me whom he has sent, you have eternal life. That's when life begins. For everybody, for anybody. Praise the Lord. See, the, in the time that Jesus came, there were, the, there were the, these different groups. There were the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were this distinct group of, uh, of religious zealots. They, they lived religious. They lived legalistic lives. And then there were the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were upper class. They were spiritual. They believed in angels. They believed in all of the things that, some of the things that the, the, the uh, Pharisees didn't believe in. And there were always arguments. Every time you'd see they, Paul, especially when Paul's preaching, they'd start talking about whether there were angels or there weren't angels or there was a resurrection or wasn't a resurrection. And the, and the conflict was always between these two different groups. They were Jews, but they just had differing views. So uh, the, 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 the Sadducees were upper class. They were, they were spiritual. They, they hung around and, and they kept watch over the temple. But neither of these groups was Jesus' favorite. In fact, there were the, the lineage of Aaron, which is where all the priests came out of. Now they call it the Kohens uh, in Israel when they try to find somebody who's in the priestly line. It's that family, the Kohens. But it was Aaron and his offspring and his progeny, if you will, that were the priest, priestly groups. And then there was the Essenes, and the Essenes were this monistic uh, kind of holy and kind of charismatic. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They were just a little bit different, a little on the fringe from the, from the average, you know. But what made the life of Jesus so peculiar was that when he came, when he manifested in this earth, he called men and women who didn't fit any of those categories expected. They didn't fall into any of those groups. Look at John chapter 20 and verse 21. This will be the last scripture. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Oh, Jesus came because he wanted the world to know the real treasure that could be in earthen vessels. He wanted them to know that God is the treasure. He is the thing that makes everything else happen. He's the source. Not someone who's going to make false demands. Not someone who's going to uh, create a, a legalistic uh, transactional kind of relationship, but a God that just wants to be in relationship, pure relationship. He wanted them to know what God was like. And none of those groups represented God. They represented an aspect of the religion. But they didn't really represent God, and that's why Jesus went out and got people that were totally disconnected from all of that. What Jesus has done is given us life. And he says, I, I'm, I'm giving you, he says, it's like beholding in, an, uh, in a glass. And as you behold it, you're transformed, you're changed from glory to glory. And what he's saying is this. He's saying, I've given you my life, the life of God, the spirit of God. And I've done that as a reflection of what I know your life can be. And as you behold him, as you are focused on the truth, you are transformed. Whether you see it or anybody else sees it, it's, it's going on. And that's what the world needs. That's the lottery ticket. You know, that's the sweepstakes ticket. That's the, you've already won some very valuable prizes. Praise the Lord. But the big one is yours too. Amen.
the guy who writes the check is yours. He belongs to you. And when you know that, when you understand that, you can change the world for somebody. Praise the Lord. That's the way this was supposed to work. I don't need to change the world for everybody. But if I can change it for one person, that person can change it for somebody else and someone else and someone else. God will do it. If, we, if we'll just tell the truth, if we'll just be honest, quit trying to sucker them in, you know, the bait and hook. Using the leader. You know, my, my dad had a furniture store, and they always had a leader. It, he sold back in those days in the 60s. They had Admiral Televisions were some, one of the big, them and RCA were the two bigger uh, electronics. It was before Sony and all these things. He sold both. But he always had a leader, and the leader was the one he advertised. Color TV, when they first come out, they were expensive. They were mammoth, huge, bulky, tubes that thick. Thick, not wide, thick. But they'd advertise, you know, a 19-inch or a 21-inch Admiral Color TV, $299, unheard of. And you get in the store, and it looks like it belongs somewhere for $2.99. Because it has nothing but an on and off switch. A metal cabinet, you know, looks like it belongs in a dorm room or something. Because right next to it is one for 1000 that's in Mediterranean wood and beautiful, you know, 27-inch big screen back in those days stereo speakers in it, you know, the whole thing. And you look at that, then you look at that, and you go, oh, my God. Car dealers, they don't take you to the demo. I mean, you know, to the, to the one that they're advertising in the paper for $5,000. They take you to the one that's the same, same model, but it's $30,000 because it has air conditioning, it has tinted windows, it has heated seats, it has heated rear view or side mirrors, it has, you know, uh, remote locks and, and uh, serious uh, radio and, you know, AMF, the, 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 the Bose speakers and, the, uh, you know, the nine CD holding deck, you know, and quad speakers everywhere, and yeah. right? And you get in that, yeah. and you start it up, and it's, mm, well, you're thinking, man, this is the life. You look up, the sun pops over, and geez, wouldn't that be cool driving down the road in this thing? How much is this, by the way? Uh, it's 38000 Whoa. Have you got anything a little less expensive? Well, and then they look at you with, like, you poor slob, you know, you're poverty stricken. I don't know why you're even looking at new cars. But yeah, I got this one over here. Hmm. What comes with this? A horn? <laughs> and handles on the door. What do you want? It, it's, it's functional. It'll get you to and from. But all of a sudden, the air just is sucked out of you because now, you know, man, if I have to settle for anything less than that, I don't even want one. That's shabby. That's, yeah. But see, that's what the church has done. They make promises. Then they get you in here and tell you, now it's your responsibility to do this and to do that and to do this and to do that. And all of a sudden, the, the, you know, the bloom is off the rose. Yeah. It's not attractive anymore. God is not attractive. They cheapen the whole thing. We need to be real with people. We need to be honest with people. Yeah. We need to let them know that this God is the deluxe model, yeah. and it's free. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen? Just get in and drive away. Yeah. He's all yours. No payment due. No holding back the first payment. 
You know, no zero interest for six years. Free. Because he loves you and gave himself for you. Praise the Lord. We need to know that, first of all, and we need to have it settled in us so that we express that in the way that we live our lives. I'm not talking about perfect, sinless lives. I'm talking about living with joy, yes. with an expectation and a hope of manifestation in every area of our life. Even if we're not seeing it today, we can declare it's a truth. It will happen. It has to happen because he said it, and he cannot lie. And he wants to give you nothing but good gifts. Can you say praise the Lord? Thank you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Well, God bless everybody. Uh, hope you all had a Merry Christmas. Thank, thanks all of you for uh, remembering Sally and I throughout the past year, and uh, especially at Christmas time, those of you. And uh, we really appreciate all of you. And I'm just believing God for a tremendous new year for every one of us. We're going to see manifestations we're believing for and have been believing for. We're going to see them because he has promised, and they shall come to pass. Let's, let's step into this new year with the expectation of good and that only. Amen. Amen. Believe for that job. Believe for that healing. Believe for that financial breakthrough. God wants you to have it more than you can imagine. Amen. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. Amen. So let's just keep our confession in agreement with what God has said. Right? Amen. Praise the Lord. And you'll be a witness of him. Hallelujah. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.